I'm sure you'd agree that information is not the same thing as implementation. I first learned that phrase from my friend, Christina Montalvo. On this podcast, we spend a lot of time talking about solid science-backed, evidence-based information and practices so you can go out and start implementing it in your life. Someone who is a woman athlete over 40, you're interested in better nutrition strategies, training, and recovery. But what happens when your efforts at implementation keep getting stuck? There is one place that people often forget. And on this podcast today, we're going to take a look at this unsung hero of implementation. If you're focused on the habits and the outcomes of those habits, you're not going deep enough. And we're going to reveal what it is right now. If you're an athletic 40 something woman who loves lifting weights, challenging yourself and doing hard shit, the Fuel Your Strength podcast is for you. You'll learn how to eat, train, and recover smarter so you build strength and muscle, have more energy, and perform better in and out of the gym. I'm strength nutrition strategist and weightlifting coach, Steph Godreau. The Fuel Your Strength podcast dives into evidence-based strategies for nutrition, training, and recovery, and why once you're approaching your 40s and beyond, you need to do things a little differently than you did in your 20s. We're here to challenge the limiting industry narratives about what women can and should do in training and beyond. If that sounds good, hit subscribe on your favorite podcast app and let's go. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for being with me here today. Make sure you hit the subscribe button on your podcast app. On this episode today, we're going to be diving into one area that I see athletic women over 40 consistently struggling with when it comes to implementing high quality information and techniques and strategies about how we need to shift our nutrition, our training, and our recovery. And this is one that is really at the heart of why sometimes implementing and making change is hard. And it's still one that our brains like to really skip over. So we're going to be diving into that on the podcast today. But before we dive in, just a friendly reminder that if, of course, you're listening to this podcast, I want to work with you on your nutrition, your training, and your recovery, really uncovering what are the strategies that you need to know and putting them into a system, it's a proven system, that is going to get you results in terms of building muscle, in terms of increasing your strength having more energy and performing better both in and out of the gym. And this is with Strength Nutrition Unlocked. We don't take everybody. We want to get on the phone with you and make sure that you're a good fit for what we do and we can help get you the transformation that you're seeking. So make sure you book a call over at stephgodrocom slash apply. You'll fill out an application. We'll get on the phone with you, hear more about you and your situation. And we'd love to work with you if you're a really good fit. Okay, I think this episode is going to be one of those food for thought episodes. And unlike other episodes I've done where there's a nice distinct list of five things to do or stop doing, this one is more of a thought piece. But I think it's really important, especially if you're listening to this show, because you're an athletic woman over 40 and you are someone who likes to challenge yourself. You know that you might have to do things differently as you continue to get older. We're all aging, so we can just pretend that that's not a thing. Of course, women are not allowed in our society to age the same way that men are. Completely different discussion for another day. But as athletic women, because of our changing physiology, as we're 40, we're heading into perimenopause and then postmenopausal for the rest of our lives. Once that event has occurred, there are some really important ways that we may need to shift not only our nutrition, but our training and our recovery. Now, does that mean we're doing things drastically different? In some cases, no. In a lot of cases, it's making some finer adjustments. In other cases, like if you're in your 50s and you haven't started strength training or resistance training yet, it's time. And that might be something brand new that you're introducing. So that's a that's a big adjustment for you. But one of the things that I see pretty consistently is this reckoning of things being different or needing to be a little bit different than they were before. For 
our changing bodies, to work with our changing lifestyles even. And that can be really, really difficult. So for example, in this group, there was a big post about turning 40 or being older, being in your 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond, and some of the things that people found really difficult. And if I could distill down the biggest things into a couple of different buckets, besides things like my mobility is different now, (laughs) there were a lot of comments and the majority of the comments fell in the bucket of, wow, I've been comparing myself to younger women and I really get discouraged or I've been comparing myself to my former athletic self, particularly if you've been athletic your entire life. You know, the way you are athletic now may not be the same thing that you did when you were in college or high school. The patience that's necessary for things, because for example, it takes in some cases longer to acquire a skill or to see muscle being built, or it takes patience because you're not recovering as quickly as you used to. And there's there's this kind of mental, emotional challenge to that. Now, a lot of the struggles that I see are because there's a couple big things lacking. Number one, nutritionally, there's some stuff going on, particularly women ending up in low energy availability. And this is not just in young women. This happens in in women 40 plus. Issues with training volume and sort of being able to manage some of that. And and that goes into what we're going to talk about today a little bit. And things like sleep, which of course can be affected by the menopause transition. So there's a lot that's shifting and changing. And of course, other things going on in your life that are just really difficult right? Maybe you are having relationship issues or you have financial stress or there's something going on at work. You have more work responsibilities or there's something going on with a family member and maybe you're having to deal with all of that. So there's just a lot that happens at this phase of life. So very often there's this, again, reckoning that things things are going to have to change a little bit and it's kind of easy to fall into the the pitfall of remembering when you were younger and the things that you used to be able to do like pull an all nighter slam a red bull at you know after 4 hours of sleep and then go to the gym and feel like a fucking million dollars <laughs> so we can't do those things anymore and it's hard sometimes to recognize that you are in a different place and and to make peace with that and then to implement the new strategies that you know are going to be better for you whether it's it's going to be less wear and tear on your joints it's going to be more recovery it's going to be making sure you get adequate nutrition and you're not skipping meals like you used to or whatever it happens to be, you're trying to do things differently, but for some reason, something's getting in the way. And if you're on this podcast, listening to this episode, and you've heard other episodes in the past, you're consuming good quality information, then we have to implement it. But why is it a struggle to implement things differently with fitness and nutrition? So let's, let's investigate this a little bit more. Many of us and potentially, you know, you listening to this episode here have really at points in your life tried to abide by the old adage of eating less, moving more. And while that might be general advice that is pretty sound for a wide swath of the population, it's not always applicable to you. And a lot of us in our 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond, have had decades, literal decades, half our life or more of this idea of eating less, eating as little as possible, and it's become kind of the false norm. So a lot of what we're trying to do is operate in new ways based on old thinking. 
And of course, our brains don't like change. And then we're scared because we think, oh my gosh, I've always been taught it's just eat less, move more, eat less, move more. So what I'm going to do approaching my you know, 40s and now 50s and 60s is I just need to remember to eat way less and move a lot more and I'm going to be golden. And we know that that's not the case because we've been trying to do it for decades and all it does is make us exhausted and burned out and binge eat or have this uncontrolled eating and makes us feel like shit. We know this doesn't work and it's not a long-term solution, but it's been repeated so much to the point of being truth for everyone that we continue to try to double down and apply it. And so I see this a lot with women who come to work with me in Strength Nutrition Unlocked or in one-on-one coaching. And I definitely see it in all of the internet chatter, which is now I've decided I'm going to get serious because I know that as a woman in my 40s and older, that I need to start preserving muscle mass. I know bone density matters. I want to continue to have function and be able to move freely and and independently for as long as possible. We know that longevity is now on the brain. And so we think, all right, I'm going to get serious about this. But now I just need to eat less and move more. And even if you've been involved in athletics for a long time, you may still be taking that in with you because frankly, a lot of us hadn't learned and never learned how to fuel ourselves properly as athletic women. We just didn't. We learned dieting. That's how we approached it. Maybe you were lucky and you had someone who really understood this, but for, I would say the vast majority of you listening to this podcast, that was not the case. You learn about nutrition and food from dieting, right? So we take that eat less, move more into this new phase of life. So here's the thing. We know we need to do things differently, but it then becomes really hard for us to implement new stuff. And then we get mad at ourselves. We think, why can't I just follow through on this? And so I want to take a specific example here. A lot of times what I talk about with my students in Strength Nutrition Unlocked is training more efficiently, training more efficiently. And so let's look at what we mean by that. What we really mean is getting the most bang for our buck out of the exercise that we are doing, not just assuming that more equals more. And that's where some of the comparison that I talked about at the beginning, where people are thinking, I'm comparing myself to those (laughs) young whippersnappers in my class. They're in their 20s. Like, They just come, they do two a days. Like I just am beating myself up because I'm not doing two a days like them. Or I had to take another rest day, right? So we think that more is going to equal more. And oftentimes we double down on that. We double down on the eating less and moving more because we feel like the current eating less and moving more that we're doing isn't working. So we must not be doing it hard enough. And this is where we get into the uh, the so the vicious cycle from hell, if you want, if we want to call it that. So what we need to do is look at training more efficiently. What we generally mean by that is lifting heavy weights. And again, it's rel- I've said this a million times. So it will probably go on my gravestone. It is relative to you. Heavy is relative to you. What's important is that you progress it over time. And we also want to think about getting your heart rate high for short periods of time, and that's really intervals. We had Dr. Stacey Sims on the podcast not too long ago, and she uses the term polarizing your training. So we want, when we do cardio, because cardio is important, especially when we're in perimenopause and postmenopausal, we start to have you know an increased risk for adverse cardiovascular effects because we're losing estrogen and so many other changes are occurring with our hormones. We, we want to do cardio, okay? It's not bad. However, we want to think about doing it efficiently, A, because who wants to be spending literally all their time in the gym training? And B, we want to be able to get the most bang for our buck, the most adaptation from our training, while also being mindful of things like 
exercise is a stressor on the body. Generally speaking, it's going to be a positive stressor. However, if our nutrition is not there, if we are under eating, if we're not eating enough protein, if we are not recovering well enough, if we're pushing ourselves too quickly into another really long, grueling workout session, for example, we might not be recovered enough. We might have issues with doing things that are too high repetition, for example, um, stress levels being higher, cortisol being higher. So we need to start thinking about all of that. And so when we start talking about training more efficiently, right, lifting heavier, it's generally going to be lower reps, lower sets. So like five sets of five and making it count, right? We might be talking about interval training, sprint intervals, or maybe some shorter hit workouts, but keeping the intervals themselves shorter. So we are, we're, are sweating. We are, it's hard. We're, we're seeing the improvement that we would expect from hit training or intervals, right? We're seeing the metabolic adaptation, like increasing our mitochondria. We're improving our insulin sensitivity. We are building muscle mass. We are improving our cardiovascular function. We are potentially reducing some of the visceral fat that can accumulate on, around our internal organs. We are seeing muscle being mobilized to grow via the strength training piece, stimulating muscle satellite cells, especially when estrogen is, is lower or is kind of fluctuating all over the place, right? We're providing the protein we need for muscle protein synthesis. We are, we're doing the things that we need to get the adaptation, but we're not just doing more for the sake of doing more. Now, yes, please go walk your freaking heart out, okay? And like, go do all your walking. That's not what we're talking about here. And I'm even sometimes a little bit remiss to talk about this because people will come back and say, she's saying that, you know, any the exercise is bad. No, that's not what we're saying. We don't, we're not dissuading people from exercising here. Of course, we're not knocking cardiovascular training or exercise in any form, but we also know that for a lot of people who like to train really hard, women over 40 who like to train hard, your athletes, you're working out with intention and focus and purpose, you have to think about how your physiology factors in because you've been trying to do the same things that you used to do and it's not working. You're exhausted, you're drained, your muscles slip sliding away off your body and you're not seeing the results that you want and you feel like crap, right? So we know it's not working to, to continue just trying to go longer and, and longer and longer and more and more and more sessions. So that's what we mean by training more efficiently. And at first, many women are like, yes, I fucking love this. It makes so much sense. The science makes a ton of sense. And even in 2021, there was a systematic review and meta-analysis that came out about um, shorter hit intervals because what a lot of people think is hit training is not true hit training. You're just trying to go, go really hard for like an hour. That's not hit training. Hit training is high intensity interval training. Yes, we're working very hard, um, but those intervals tend to be shorter. And then we have sprint interval training, sit, which is when the intervals are even shorter than you would see in a typical HIT workout. This is what we mean, again, by efficiency. So you're like, okay, I'm listening to all this. Okay, there's, yes, there's, mo there's more science than, than this one study to back this up. But okay, the science makes sense. Okay, I get the physiology is changing. And so your logical brain is like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep, all right, I'm totally going to do this. And then you start to look at your week of training and actually do your training. And this is where the issue comes up for a lot of people. And this is what this podcast is all about. And I know I spent 20 minutes setting up this, this story, but you know, sometimes we just got to get there by explaining everything. So this is the one place where I see people really struggling when they're looking at changing their nutrition, their training, their recovery practices. They have the right information. They're not getting their information from butt selfie influencers. 
Thank you very much. Um, They're looking to implement. They're ready for change. Even though change is hard and scary, they're like, okay, I'm ready to do this. Like, I'm going to make change because I know that what I was doing before isn't working. And then they are like, okay, now it's time for me to do it. And they do their lifting. They do a couple of interval sessions per week. And they're like, oh my God, I feel like this wasn't enough. What? This, that's it? (laughs) And this is where we run into the issue of beliefs. So beliefs are a big factor in us as we are approaching our changing physiology and training, doing fitness and nutrition in different ways. Beliefs are going to get in our way. Now, again, this is normal. Your brain doesn't like change. You're going to have a belief stuffed into a belief suitcase you've been carrying around all your life. And sometimes you don't even know what those beliefs are. But when it comes to the efficiency of training example, we oftentimes see women struggle with this because they're like, oh my gosh, I just, I got to, you know, Wednesday or Thursday and I felt like I wasn't doing enough. I had to do more. I feel lazy if I'm not in there doing my workout for hours or my cardio session didn't take me two and a half hours to complete. We've been indoctrinated in the no pain, no gain mentality. Again, the like move more, 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 more training, more sessions. I'm not going to get the results unless I'm putting in more time, more actual workouts this week, right? Raise your hand if you've ever started the new year and you're like, I'm going to do a, you know, 90 minute workout every single day and never skip a day, right? We've all been there. Um, You think you're lazy if you're not in there for hours at a time and you'll start to question it and doubt. Questioning's fine. But you'll start to doubt the process, especially if it's in the beginning. You're like, oh my God, you know, every the wheels are going to fall off this wagon. I'm not training enough. I'm not doing enough volume. I'm not doing enough time. And you will step away and you'll go back to what you did before. Again, our brains don't like change. This is very normal. But it's because the beliefs about what a good exerciser, who is a good exerciser? Who is a dedicated exerciser? Who has value when it comes to fitness? It's the person who's the most fucking dedicated, right? And it even goes so far as to sometimes encourage really unhealthy behaviors. And again, people are like, but exercise is healthy. Well, not when it's over exercise, right? And those are sometimes the people who get praised the most because they're so dedicated. And I speak from personal experience, right? As an endurance athlete, people are like, oh my God, you're so dedicated. Yes. I was also very overtrained and under eating and miserable. So yes, you know, if you want, if you want to be moving, that's okay. You know, let's walk every day. Recently, I did, I did a challenge with my Strength Nutrition Unlocked students where we challenge ourselves to walk a little every day. You know, get your non-exercise activity up, right? Move around, do more stuff around the house, get up and um, you know, put away the clothes on the other side of the room, walk to do your errands if you can, you know, like there's lots of different ways you can incorporate more non-exercise activity. So that could be something that you substitute in. And hey, walking is fucking amazing. And it's a really good way to get your baseline of daily movement up without piling on a lot of exercise stress. So I say all this because I want you to think about when you're okay, you're like, I'm bought in with the science. I get that. I'm ready to make change. And then you start to notice that you are like quote unquote self-sabotaging or you're not following through. A lot of times we think it's just because we need better habits or the way we're doing things is not right. And sometimes that can be the case, but oftentimes it comes down to the beliefs that you are holding about that thing 
right? So if we're working on if exercising more efficiently, training more efficiently, which generally means, you know, getting the most that we can out of the least amount of time, notice where that bumps up against your belief of who is a good exerciser. You know, again, our society is like obsessed with not being lazy. And there are so many reasons for that. There's an amazing book on it called Laziness Does Not Exist by Dr. Devin Price. Highly recommend. But we have these underlying beliefs, right? We can't sit around. We can't be lazy. We have to be pushing it all the time. And so we have to go deeper. And the same thing comes up with nutrition, right? Eat less, eat less, eat less. It's the same thing you can take yourself through. Go back and listen to this episode again, but think about food this time. And I'm not going to go into that example here because I did the exercise efficiency example. But suffice to say, we have to go deeper. And this is where coaching is really helpful because it helps you uncover and, and develop awareness of these deeper beliefs that could be the reason why you're having a harder time implementing change. Even when your logical brain understands on the surface why it's important. Now, I'm not a therapist and I'm not a mental health professional, but this is what I'm seeing from coaching, right? Coaching is how we help you implement habits and behaviors to create new outcomes for yourself now and in the future. And it's very interesting to observe how beliefs intersect here with changing our habits around training and fueling and recovery. So here's, I think, how we tie a little bit of a bow on this episode. The book Atomic Habits by James Clear. If you've read it, then this is going to be a little bit of a a, a look into a section of the book. But James Clear talks about a model for essentially getting new outcomes, right? Changing our habits, getting the things that we want, changing your behavior for good, as he says. And this model is different than what a lot of people think about when they're trying to make habit change. They're either trying to change, they're usually trying to change the habit. And so we have this kind of three-layer, almost bullseye. We have the outcomes, right? These are the results that you want. Goals, if you will. Targets might be another word for that. The second layer on, on the inside of that is the process. These are the habits and the systems, the routines that you have for yourself. And this is where most people try to make change. They try to go straight for the habits to get the outcomes, But the model that he talks about has a deeper layer, which is identity. And this is involved in looking at your beliefs, your worldview, your judgments, um, your assumptions, your biases. And I think this is where this concept that I'm talking about comes to light. It's because as we're approaching our 40s and beyond as women athletes, we're trying to make change based on our old identities, our previous versions of ourselves, if you will, or what works for other, you know, younger people in our gym, the 20 year olds that we train alongside. So if we think about this bullseye model, identity is at the center. Then we have process, which is our habits. And then the final kind of the outermost layer is the outcomes. These are the results that you want. And so I think there's some really interesting food for thought here. So I'm going to quote him. So he writes on his website, to change your behavior for good, you need to start believing new things about yourself. You need to build identity-based habits. Imagine how we typically set goals. We might start by saying, I want to get stronger. If you're lucky, someone might say, that's great, but you should be more specific. So then you say, I want to squat 300 pounds. And these goals are centered around outcomes, not identity. So he goes on to say that there are two steps. Number one, decide the type of person you want to be. And number two, prove it to yourself with small wins. This is just a tiny, tiny snippet from the book. Highly recommend you go read the whole thing. But I thought that this dovetailed very nicely with what I was trying to say in this episode. So if you are finding yourself ready to start implementing change, you want 
new results. You want to build those new habits, those systems and structures in your life to get you different outcomes because you know, as a woman athlete over 40, you're going to have to do some things differently. Don't forget about that deepest layer, about the identity, the beliefs that you hold, who you assume yourself to be, the judgments that you have about yourself and others and the world. For example, the judgment that we can't be lazy if we do less or we work out more efficiently, that that's somehow lazy and it's not enough. And notice how those beliefs change or affect your ability to be able to follow through with the implementation of the new habits that you want. Of course, you can develop this awareness on your own. It's great to start being curious and asking yourself lots lots of questions, but a coach can help you get there so much faster. If you haven't heard my episode on six reasons you need a nutrition coach, then definitely hop back a few episodes and check that one out. It's worth listening to. Thank you so much for joining me today on this episode of the podcast. I hope you learned something, especially something a little bit deeper than what we tend to talk about in terms of the technicalities on this show, and that you're able to then apply some of this to your life or finally realize that, you know what, it might be time to get help, to get a coach, to invest in yourself and your own growth and progress. We would love to help you do that in Strength Nutrition Unlocked. So to book a call and chat with us about if you're a good fit, then you can do that at stephgodrow.com slash apply. Remember to hit the subscribe button on your podcast app. It means a lot. It goes a long way. And there are also lots of other ways you can support the show. Share this episode out in your Instagram stories and tag me, tell a friend or a loved one or a training partner or a coach about this episode and share the love. That stuff means a ton and it really does go quite a long way. Of course, you can also grab the show notes for this episode at stephgodrow.com. All right, I will see you next week. Thank you so much for being here. And until then, stay strong.